So it is well known that the sample complexity of tomography depends on how we are allowed to measure the quantum states. In particular, if we only allow single copy measurements, then it takes omega uh, theta d cube copies for tomography. And on the other hand, if we allow multi-copy measurements, then it requires only requires d squared copies for tomography. So of course here, tomography is not the optimal algorithm for our task, but this example gives evidence that maybe the optimal sample complexity of our task could depend on whether we allow single copy measurements or multi-copy measurements. In addition, because our task also involves classical communication, the sample complexity could also depend on how Alice and Bob are allowed to communicate. So in the weakest setting called simultaneous message pass passing, Alice and Bob just sends one message to a referee who computes a function. A stronger setting is one-way communication where Alice sends one message to Bob who computes a function. And the most general setting is interactive communication where Alice and Bob can communicate multiple rounds. So we have introduced two models for measurement and three models for communication. And a priori, the above six models could all lead to different sample complexity for this task. But we show this is not the case. So our main result is the following. The optimal sample complexity for distributed quantum inner product estimation is maximum of one over epsilon squared and square root d over epsilon. And this remains the same across all measurement and communication models. So when epsilon is the constant, this gives k equals square root d, which is two to the n over two, where n is number of qubits. So let's try to understand what this result means. First, regarding the cross-platform verification task, we conclude that it, it requires less samples than tomography because square root d represents a savings compared with d squared or d cubed. But this task still requires exponential number of samples, number of qubits, even with the most powerful measurements allowed by quantum mechanics. So this means that this task is not scalable in general. And second, let's think about the sample complexity from the perspective of shadow tomography. So shadow tomography tells us that linear functions of an unknown quantum state can be estimated sample efficiently. So in our task, we also have a linear function, but our task is not sample efficient because the classical communication constraint seems to be a barrier for achieving sample efficiency. And finally, let's focus on the fact that the sample complexity remains the same across all measurement and communication models. So this is interesting because besides tomography, we also have many other examples that are known, which demonstrate large separations between single and, uh, single and multi-copy measurements for single system probability testing, as shown by these works. But in our distributed setting, access to multi-copy measurements does not provide an advantage. And it's an intriguing open question to study whether this behavior is only true for the inner product or is true in general. So next, let's move on to the proof sketch where we focus on a simpler problem. So here, Alice and Bob have a decision problem. They are promised that one of the following two cases hold and they need to decide which case are they in. So in case one, Alice has k copies of a state phi and Bob has k copies of the same state phi, where phi is a uniformly random state according to the Haar measure. In case two, Alice has k copies of phi and Bob has k copies of psi, where phi and psi are independently uniformly distributed. So here the key difference is that in case one, the states are the same, and in case two, the states are independent. So this problem is a special case for our original problem, because in case one, the inner product always equals to one. And in case two, with very high probability, the inner product is exponentially small because the states are independent. So to prove our main result for this simpler problem, we only need to prove two bounds. 
first using single copy measurements and simultaneous message passing, which is the weakest model across all different models. And Alice and Bob can decide which case they are in with all spiral D copies. And second, even with multi-copy measurements and interactive communication, Alice and Bob still require at least omega spiral D copies to decide. So let's start with the upper bound, which is the simpler one. So here, the main idea is to perform the classical shadows algorithm in a correlated way. So here's the sketch of the algorithm. First, Alice and Bob use shared randomness to sample a random unitary matrix U. So in other words, Alice and Bob share the same random unitary matrix. And this is what I mean by correlated. And next, Alice and Bob both apply U to each of their states, each copy of their states. And next, Alice and Bob both measure each copy of their states in the computational basis and obtain bit strings A and B. So to decide which case they're in, Alice and Bob can simply count the number of collisions between A and B. And if it's large, they decide the same state. If it is small, they decide independent state. So here I'm not specifying what large and small means, but the intuition that this algorithm works comes from the birthday paradox. So in the birthday paradox, if we have a uniform distribution on D elements and we keep drawing samples from it, then we expect to see collisions, meaning we see the same sample twice after drawing all square root D samples. So in our problem, the situation has a similar behavior. In case one where Alice and Bob has the same state, the probability distribution of Alice and Bob's measurement outcomes in the third step are slightly more correlated than the other case. And therefore, with all square root D uh, samples, we expect to see more collisions in case one than the other case. And this finishes the proof. So next, let's move on to the lower bound, where we want to show even with multi-copy measurements and the interactive communication, Alice and Bob still require at least uh, omega square root D copies to decide. So here, the main idea is to think about the symmetric subspace. So when thinking about multi-copy measurements, we need to change our perspective. Instead of thinking about Alice and Bob's states as K copies of some quantum states, we just think of it as one copy of a very large quantum state, because now we can perform a global quantum operation. Of course, these kinds of states have a special structure because no matter which case Alice and Bob are in, their state is always of the form phi tensor K for some states phi. So these states are special in the sense that they belong to the symmetric subspace which is defined as the set of states that are invariant under any permutation across the K subsystems. So an alternative definition of the symmetric sus subspace is the span of the type of states of the form phi tensor K. So it's obvious that the second definition is contained in the first definition, but they're actually equivalent. So the equivalence, um, of the two definitions is non-trivial, and we refer to this paper by Aram Harrell for a proof. So to understand what Alice and Bob can do on their states, we need to characterize uh, the kind of measurements we can do in the symmetric subspace. So a POVM in the symmetric subspace is basically a set of positive operators that sums to pi sim, where pi sim is the projection onto the symmetric subspace. In particular, we also consider the following POVM as the standard POVM in the symmetric subspace, which is a continuous POVM in the product basis 
So here, du denotes the Haar measure, and this coefficient equals to the dimension of the symmetric subspace. So it is natural to understand this standard POVM from the perspective of the second definition of the symmetric subspace, because they have a similar structure. Okay, so now let's try to prove the lower bound. And let's start by considering the, a one-way protocol. So in a one-way protocol, what Alice and Bob can do is that Alice can perform some POVM and obtain a result I. And then she sends the result I to Bob. So at this point, Bob knows what measurement Alice performed as well as her measurement result I. So after this, there is no more Alice and it is Bob's responsibility to decide which case they're in. So now let's think from Bob's pers perspective. So in case one, when Alice and Bob has the same state, Bob's state will get updated after seeing the measurement outcome I as follows. So this state rho looks a bit complicated, but this is just saying that Bob's state is no longer uniformly distributed because he received some additional information. So those states that have higher overlap with the measurement operator mi are more likely. So in case two, when Alice and Bob have independent states, Bob's state is always the maximally mixed state in the symmetric subspace. So here, what we prove is that when k is smaller than square root d, the states rho and sigma m are indistinguishable by any quantum measurement. And this implies the one-way lower bound. So next, we show how to prove the indistinguishability between rho and sigma m. So the proof is to think about this measure and prepare channel. So this equation is just a new way to think about the state rho. So previously, previously in the state rho, we have this measurement operator mi. But now we change our perspective and think of this as a input state to a quantum channel. So let's think about what this quantum channel mp is doing. So if you recall the definition of the standard POVM in the symmetric subspace, what this uh, quantum channel is doing is to measure the input state using the uh, standard POVM and then prepare k copies of the measurement outcome. So in fact, this measure and prepare channel is well studied in the literature. And here using a result known as Triabella theorem, we show that the output of MP is indistinguishable from sigma M, regardless of the input state, when K is smaller than square root D. So this completes the proof for a lower bound against the one-way protocols. And we can also show that this can be generalized to a lower bound against arbitrary interactive communication. So, so this uh, completes the proof sketch for our simplified problem. And I'll conclude by mentioning some open problems. So first, note that in our problem, we only considered classical communication. And it is natural to ask what happens when we allow a small amount of quantum communication, such as O, uh, o log n qubits, and whether this would help reduce the sample complexity by a small amount. And second, it is interesting to prove um, upper and lower bounds for other distributed quantum property estimation problems, as well as estimating multiple properties at the same time, following the ideas of shadow tomography. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, um, you can come up to the podium here. So, um, so, as far as I understood, we have this complexity for all 
our models, uh, sorry, communication models. And this is include premium pseudos, national best model, pseudos, shared randomness. Right? I know. What happens if you have just private randomness? Yeah, that's a good question. So, in the weakest communication model, we have this simultaneous message, message passing, but we still assume that Alice and Bob could have shared randomness. So without shared randomness, we would expect that the sum of massive would be worse, but we didn't do it. Okay. What do you expect? What do you do? That's hard, always. No. Um, for pure state, it could be require uh, only the deep mm. Okay, thank you. Amazing talk, thank you very much. Um, the question is, if you have some pre, uh, because what you proved is for the case where you have no information about the state, so it's unknown state, state uh, beforehand. So what is the case if you have some information about the state? Could you decrease maybe the scaling from being exponential number of qubits to let's say something polynomial? Or how much information would you need to in order to achieve that? Yeah, that's a great question. So our result is all about the worst case. So we don't hmm. make any assumptions on the input state. And of course, naturally, if we have some addition, additional prior knowledge on the quantum state, the sample complexity could change. And one example would be if we know that the input states are mixed, hmm. because as we see from the lower bound, it's sort of saying that the hardest instance of this problem is pure states. So if the input states are already pretty mixed, then probably the sample complexity would, would decrease and would depend on the purity. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, <clears throat> do you also have a characterization of the amount of common randomness and the rate that you need um, for to, to complete this protocol? Like... Right, so in our problem, we basically only uh, care about sample complexity. And uh, essentially all the computational complexity and shared randomness could depend exponentially in the number of qubits. But for the simpler, simplest protocol with uh, this, uh, Correlated class of shadows, one could try to come up with a uh, approximate unitary 40 plan to avoid this global uh, random unitary, and that could be more efficient in terms of both randomness and circuit complexity. Yeah, I'm, I'm more concerned about the communication cost because uh, I feel like if you allow for limited communication, then uh, the many copy measurements might be better than single copy measurements. I don't know yeah, if you have. Yeah, that's possible, and we didn't consider the communication cost. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.